Hello and welcome to a very special London Games Festival industry panel. My name is Ros Tuplin and today we'll be looking at how modern artists are intersecting with games and games technology to create new works. Young artists who grow up with games often find them to be useful tools for creativity and inspiration. And today I'm joined by three London-based artists who have all explored digital worlds and interactivity. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Callum Bowden. Callum, tell us Hello. a bit about yourself. <laughs> My name is Callum Bowden. I always find it very difficult to define what I do. Um, it kind of sits between different contexts and media. Um, I am here because I worked recently with virtual reality. Um, I made a narrative VR experience called Mephisto and the Extremophile. But in my other, other sides of my practice, I co-founded a kind of collective that exists online and in Berlin called Trust, um, where we're using play to, to model different possibility spaces and to kind of create ways of engaging with politics and economics um, in a safe and, and sandboxed environment. And yeah, did you want me to talk more about these projects or? We'll, we'll get into it shortly. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great intro and it, it, yeah, it's all, all very innovative and exciting. So thank you, Callum. Um, I'd also like to introduce David Blandy. Hello, I'm David Hi. Blandy. I'm a, uh, I guess, visual artist, video artist, video game artist, performance artist type person. Um, I have made a number of works since... Um, Showing my age here since '97, using video games, and um, recently made a VR experience um, called Planetarium of Grief. And um, yeah, I also work within the uh, tabletop role playing game sphere using things like um, video conferencing to imagine different worlds. So, yeah, kind of in the similar space to Columna. Amazing. Thank you so much, David. And finally, we have Christina Punyakaira. Christina, are you there? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for having me. Um, yes. So very similarly to um, Callum and David, um, I also work with VR and AR. I work with, um, with the games engine Unity. So I kind of use Unity in order to build worlds and then I film those worlds and create um, either 360 VR or um, moving image work or installation based work um, using the medium of, of kind of game and world building. Um, I also, um, yes, I, I also work with um, kind of different interactive media as well as projection mapping. So it all kind of fits into my work that kind of deals with, um, kind of sits between art, science and technology and deals with um, like how, what's the question of how can we use technology in order to build more sustainable worlds? So yeah, that's me and I, I in a nutshell, thanks. Amazing, yeah, that's a uh, very important question for right now. So, uh, so let's take a kind of deeper dive into into your practice and, and uh, the, the, the specific ways in which you're using this game technology. If you can think of specific projects that maybe you can explain to our audience and and, uh, and maybe talk in depth about um, the stories you're telling with with, uh, with game technology. So, if I can start with you, Callum, let's uh, let's get some more context on the work. Yeah, definitely. So. In 2019, I made a VR project called Mephisto and the Extremophile, which I describe as a, a journey to the edge of scientific knowledge. It um, follows the discovery of a nematode worm, the deepest an animal has ever been found on Earth. Um, the nematode is called Haleocephalobus Mephisto, and it was found six kilometers or four kilometers under the surface of a South African gold mine by a scientist called Gaten Borgoni. And the VR experience is about trying to, to not just tell this story, but kind of, I was interested in trying to create the feeling of what world these extremophiles live in. Um, and through that, try to rethink what it is to be human, or um, it's quite, quite big and philosophical, but I was quite interested that only until the late 20th century, um, 
was it learned that life could exist um, on energy sources that didn't come from the sun? So up until the 1970s, it was really thought that all life needed sunlight. Um, and then around deep sea uh, hydrothermal vents, these complex ecologies of life were discovered um, that were living off of the energy in the, um, that were coming out of these uh, underwater volcanoes. And, and that kind of began shifting the scientific understanding of what life was. And so I was interested in, in trying to use the proprioceptive and the phenomenological qualities of VR to see if, if it was possible to even like alienate away from the human experience of the world. Um, and so that, yeah, that's kind of one, one project. And then in, in my collective practice with trust, we use games to find new ways of doing research together. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we started a, a game show called Plotting. And our attempt was to try and kind of find a way of collectively negotiating the strange world that we found ourselves in. Um, we became really interested in Twitch live streams um, over the past few years and and wanted to, to find a way of using online tools to, to in some way develop a, a dialogue together. So the plotting worked. It was kind of like a card game, a virtual card game. We used... Um, it's like an online design tool called Figma. And we shared this Figma board and we green screened ourselves on top of it, um, made these cards with different research topics or ideas, and we would have to sort them on a, on a board, on an axis. So these are kind of like two very different approaches that I'm using in my practice. One is the VR experience wasn't so much a, a game um, as it was engaging with game engines as a storytelling um, mechanism. And then, yeah, on the other side, kind of like playing with social formats online and, and seeing also in this kind of post-pandemic reality, um, finding ways, like playful approaches to, to understanding understanding where we were. That's really interesting. So yeah, work, work that's very much about um, the industry and then works that are, are about something that's alienating or that are um, Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, so David, can you uh, send questions? Can you tell us a bit, a bit more about uh, what it is you think about doing? Um, well, for much of my practice, I've been looking at the um, the idea of the self in the landscape, in a way, um, in that landscape being the video game landscape. So placing um, the viewer inside a background from Tekken 2, for instance, that was one of my early, early works using a video game, uh, through to the work that I've done with um, Larry Action Poll. Uh, like Finding Fanon 2 and FF Gate and Delete, where we use the Grand Theft Auto 5 um, video game engine as a tool for um, creating a space in which you can explore, you can kind of um, investigate this very problematic space, a space built for, um, for violence, essentially. Um, but as um, a kind of single avatar. And then, um, yeah, in the work with, with Larry, it becomes this, these kind of dual avatars walking through the space and searching for the ghost of Fan, Franz Fanon within this space. So, um, yeah, thinking of kind of um, machinima, the, the making video games, um, making films within, within video games as a kind of uh, philosophical space, I suppose, to, to think. But... Yeah, I've also been using Unity for s several years in my work, uh, creating VR experiences like um, The End of the World, which is a, a, like a planetarium. But there I was really interested in, a bit like Callum, the, the kind of the intense isolation of, of the VR experience. Um, it's the space in which you have these, this voice in your head, um, like in, in a planetarium experience, you're sort of seeing the cosmos passing by and you have this 
these headphones on that, that place the voice right inside you in a weird way and what that intimacy uh, can create and whether it can be a space that you can um, think about um, your existence, about um, virtual worlds dying. It, it kind of featured the story of um, Asheron's Cool, which was a video game um, online space, big uh, RPG space that was shut down because the server was closed. Um, so this game that all these people have been playing for, I think, around 15 years um, just no longer existed anymore. What, what, what did that mean? I found that really interesting. Um, and, and then more directly using Unity as a tool for some of the works like, um, yeah, a Lament for Power, um, recent work with, with Larry. Um, so we're kind of creating scenarios using it almost as, as a, as a it's a, a film kit, but also referencing those uh, video game horrors like um, Resident Evil, Silent Hill, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's um, it's been there as a constant, as, as kind of um, the self and the virtue. And Larry is uh, Larry Ashton Palm, is that? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I said that earlier. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, no, yeah, Larry Ashton Palm, the British Ghanaian artist who I've collaborated with for the last. Eight years almost. Yes, so, yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting that, yeah, I feel like the themes that are, are coming out, there's, there's a way of looking at games that is very much about um, introspective, quite alienated, you know, quite, quite sort of solo experiences. And then also there's, there's this capacity for sort of something that's very community based and something that's, that's about connecting people. Um, so, Christina, can you tell us can you tell us a bit more about your work and um, um, you know how, how that maybe continues that that theme? Yeah. So, um, I guess I I will start with um, a work that I did um, in 2018 called Lizard Gaze, which is a work about basically I built this environment in Unity uh, where. Um, it's, it's, it's like a desert-like space where these two lizards are entering the room and they're basically being curators. And I was trying to imagine um, to imagine a new way of um, looking at sculptures, a new way of looking at art. And in a way, it was... Um, so for me, that was just looking through the eyes of an animal. So in this case, a lizard. And I kind of imagined this environment where um, you basically get to experience um, sculpture as terrain rather than as something visual. So actually, kind of like how can we experience things uh, via touch in a way, or how can we experience things as things that we can inhabit or climb into almost? Uh, because I guess, you know, when you think about digital media and when you think about objects um, in digital virtual spaces, um, you know, they can be made porous and you can enter them. And I kind of started thinking, I was really obsessed with this idea of, you know, being inside a sculpture. So being inside of, um, you know, Venus the Milo or being inside something that is marble in real life and you can't really enter. But then once you're in a virtual world, you can, you know, you can be inside and you can kind of inhabit all these nooks and crannies. Um, yeah, like a lizard. So that was one of the works that I did using Unity. And um, another work that I created is actually an AR work. And it's, um, it's for me, it was a big revelation when I found out that, um, you know, you can use a game engine like Unity to both create VR and AR experiences. And I did uh, create this experience, um, this um, augmented reality experience where um, I've used, I used three different um, kind of metallic pyramid objects in order to create um the sensation of a person getting um, an implant. So they would put like the little object in, on their hand and they would kind of like put the hand underneath the camera and then a camera is like, it sits inside, this, this tablet sits inside a box which looks like very much like an operating box. And then this experience emerges and you can basically see how things are being implanted in your hand. So I was, uh, it was quite visceral and people were really kind of reacting to it. They were freaking out, most of them. Um, and it was, the animation is so crude, I guess, when you look at some really kind of high-end um, games and experiences. But because it's AR, because it's kind of like a, a mix of real life and um, kind of super, super imposed animation, 
it worked so well. And the like the main problem that I was posing was, you know, how how averse people are to actually uh, to, to becoming cyborgs. So you know, where does that fine line stand be- between becoming a cyborg, becoming um, enhanced in some? So I, I had three scenarios. One of them was actually a very scary scenario where you're kind of implanted with nanobots and you can create weapons um, that come out of your hands and stuff. But some of them, well, most of them, the other two scenarios were um, just kind of being able to speak to animals. So kind of like getting that idea of having the bubble fish implanted into you and so you can speak to, um, yeah, to different species. And the third scenario was just um, kind of thinking about um, yeah, how, how can we become more sustainable as humans? And um, like, are we actually able to photosynthesize in some way? So it's, it's, it was very speculative. But um, yeah, again, kind of very interesting how, how much people forgive when you're outside of that world, uh, outside of the virtual world. So if it's something that kind of sits between reality and fiction, um, yeah, it was um, really interesting to see how, how forgiving people are. Um, yeah, we're using crude animation, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. It's interesting so you're talking time. about people freaking out um, and sort of quite ex- extreme uses for VR. I mean, you're, you're all dabbling with VR and it's giving you, uh, yeah, this opportunity for something um, hyper immersive or, um, or quite challenging as an experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, what, what does the panel think generally about um you know, what's coming to VR and for the, the possibility of widespread public use and understanding. Do you think that that has changed in recent years? And do you think, uh, do you think there's real potential there for, for the general public? Alan, what do you think? I am... Um, my understanding of where VR was going really shifted um, this time last year with COVID. Um, after doing this kind of like initial experiment, and I always saw it as a prototype and trying to see how I could shift scales of perception in VR and like engage with this idea of story feeling over storytelling. But I was, I found the, the isolation of the experience really limiting and like it's very inaccessible. Um, it's very hard to show people. It, like I made it for Rift S, so it needed a high powered gaming machine. Uh, I have a friend with like vision problems and like they were not able to even engage with the piece. And so I kind of was really interested in ways of creating VR that bled into other media or like to translate between the isolating and the social. I wanted to kind of create a social VR experience that would also have um, an element of performance beyond just the headset. So it could be engaging to people, um, who weren't, weren't able to put a headset on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I kind of before was interested in VR, like location based entertainment and, um, social VR experiences after the pandemic, I'm maybe more interested in like interactive web experiences or video games. Um, I think VR is interesting for, for how it locks people away and monopolizes attention. But then also for those reasons, it's kind of, um, I think the context in which VR is situated is really important and it's harder to do that in a domestic space. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Definitely, definitely. I mean, we'll talk, we'll talk a bit about exhibition uh, in a bit, but um, but yeah, that's that's a really interesting point, David. What are your thoughts about VR and the, the future of VR? <laughs> I think VR is in a really difficult space. I think I think AR has a lot of potential. I think that's mm-hmm. going to be built into particular um, gizmos and kind of extensions and kind of become a, you know, in the sort of Google Glass extended sort of way, become part of um, our lives in maybe in the way that the phones have. Um, but VR itself is, yeah, it's it's got so many barriers to entry. And not only that, I think, you know, the, the whole pandemic experience has made it very, um, has kind of made, made the idea of just holding yourself away even more 
um, undesirable somehow. Um, and I've found myself over this last year, um, yeah, as, as I said earlier, kind of moving into uh, tabletop role playing because in, in that VR space, everyone shares the same VR space, but it's a space in your head. And that it's told through stories. And it's like, you know, it's really elemental. It's just people talking around a campfire, but you're talking over Zoom. So you're, um, you're seeing the person's reactions. You're kind of, it's almost like everyone's an avatar already. And um, the space is kind of rendered in super high definition because it's just your head. Imagine the space. Um, so it gets over a lot of those barriers. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's uh, you know, maybe it's like a transitional um, medium, you know, like 3D glasses or something. But um, we'll, we'll see. You know, maybe maybe someone can, can, can really kind of bring a VR thing down into something very um, compact and take away some of the um, nausea issues, which, uh, you know, I mean, these sorts of accessibility things, they're not, it's not just like, oh, it's a bit of a problem that 40% of people can't deal with this thing. This, you know, that's exclusionary and you don't want to have that as part of your, part of your art practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Christina, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with um, Callum and David. I think I think that it is a um, you know a huge accessibility issue. Um, there is a huge accessibility issue around VR, and um, yes, I guess devices are also you know there is also a financial barrier to access. Um, and I I do appreciate that you know there there are ways of experiencing. Um, VR using uh, Google Cardboard or you know cardboard mockups, um, but also kind of um, I guess you know um, VR headsets are becoming cheaper and more affordable. But then yes, there is the other barrier of access, which is um, you know just it's not. Um, yeah, there are so many problems still. I guess although VR as as an idea as a technology is almost I think seventy years old. That's crazy. Um, but, um, but yes, there is, it's still riddled with problems, with issues. Um, I do agree that AR has a more interesting future ahead of it um, as a technology. Um, I do agree that um, imagination is the best technology. Um, so, so yes, things that are uh, transpire inside our brains, um, I don't think that they will ever, ever be trumped by um, technologies like this. But I guess, um, I guess yes, kind of... Um, I'm not. I'm not saying no to VR experiences, not at all, of course. But I think that if um, if the same experience can be accessed in different ways, um, uh, I guess you know, just if you're if I'm able to access something on a VR headset, but also on a computer, on a screen, and I can navigate easily, um, then then it's it kind of like yeah, it, it solves these problem problems of access, I think, mm -hmm. uh, which is very very important. And I have been looking at um, AR glasses, and I think that uh, there are some indie companies that are developing AR glasses that are very affordable, which kind of like involve you putting your phone. Or, you know, so they're weird contraptions still. I guess, you know, HoloLens um, or Magic Leap are just like the, the very big ones out there, but they're very, very expensive and difficult um, to use and to get your hands on. But I think that we are going in the right direction. It's kind of opening the experience up to the wider public and making it more accessible. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there are there are sort of limitations, I suppose, with every medium and every technology. Um, in terms of sort of opportunities, though, what what attracted uh, you all to using games as a medium in the first place? Uh, did you feel like it presented, yeah, a unique opportunity to tell a particular story? Was was it the only way that you were able to to talk about things you want to talk about? And um, Callum, how did you get started with games? So, I mean, I think this addresses maybe another question that's on the list. But um, I grew up with games, immersed within games. Um, after school, I would go home and play Roller Coaster Tycoon or The Sims, um, Dance Dance Revolution. Like all of these things were. Um, very much a part of my childhood. So it, um, the first like maybe more artistic project I did with games was, um, it was called calls of duty and it was, I situated choruses inside, um, inside 
uh, Call of Duty. So I occupied the voice channels of multiplayer war games, trying to stage kind of nonviolent interventions within these um, spaces. And so like that's kind of my first exploration of different ways of engaging with video games. Um, now I'm really excited and I guess this maybe ties into it, but like play, I think is something that contemporary art often doesn't engage with. Like everybody is so serious all the time. Um, selling things is so serious, but if we could be a little bit more playful, have some fun, it's actually a really nice way for creative practitioners to engage with, with politics or engage with economics, um, engage with these huge systemic questions that are like really beyond any of us individually and create social ways of exploring these things. Um, games provide low risk environments, uh, for collective engagement and like allowing for emergent outcomes without knowing exactly where things are going. And I also found it really interesting what David was saying around, um, like not wanting to lock yourself away into these isolating experiences anymore. It's like my answer to the question around what games have I been playing recently? It's board games. It's like Monopoly. It's role playing games. A lot of my friends do live action role playing. So I've been engaging with that. Um, and yeah, as Christine is saying, I think like the imagination is the strongest technology we have and technology actually needs more imagination. So um, and I think that's what's really exciting about artistic approaches to, to game technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the potential for, for collaboration and connection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I love the idea of the, the Call of Duty uh, <laughs> interventions. That's wonderful. And it sort of, yeah, it, it, it reminds me of what, what David was saying earlier about Grand Theft Auto and kind of remaking a space that is riddled with uh, with problems and, and kind of looking at it in a different way. Um, yeah, David, can you, can you tell us a bit more about how you got involved in, in, in game stuff and your history with games and what, you know, why it is that you, you feel you can do this, this kind of fun stuff in these spaces? Bollocks. <laughs> there we go. Classic. Um, yeah, I, I, I grew up in the virtual world, I suppose. I grew up um, playing games on my my, my dad's Amstrad. <laughs> we weren't cool enough to have a good console. So um, that was, and from that, yeah, getting into like Street Fighter, um, Final Fantasy, et cetera, it just became like a place where, where I, a place that I inhabited. So um, as my art practice continued, it became obvious that I had to engage with the space that actually was one of the places that I was living. You know, I, I, want, I was interested in very sculptural matters of space. You know? So what is, what is space? What is the space underneath the chair? What is the space held inside a record? What is the space of a video game? So I started kind of going around Doom and taking shots of that as kind of virtual environments, uh, incorporating that into a comic that I made. That was the first thing I ever did with a video game. Um, and then, um, yeah, started bringing like Ryu in. He was sitting on the sofa next to me while I was playing Street Fighter. And then like I turned Mario into a sort of Dario, sort of, sort of did a self-portrait inside Mario 64, um, took the background from Yoshimitsu stage and turned it into kind of a sublime forest that you, was projected onto the wall. I mean, this is like ancient technology, so it's SD and it's really bad, but like it's, it was, you know, the, the thought was there. So it, yeah, I was kind of working through games in that way. And then it kind of progressed into thinking about um, kind of the relationship to games and then sort of um, my place in geopolitical history. So I was looking at, um, like my relationship to Japan because a lot of my favorite games are Japanese. And then um, my grandfather was a Japanese prisoner of war. So there's this kind of strange conflict between what's, what's permitted, what's not permitted and space of escape. Um, so that got me kind of ruminating on, yeah, Ryu's journey and um, um, the death of um, Eris, etc. So you kind of, that, that all came in. And then, yeah, through working with, with, with Larry, it, uh, Larry Achenpong, it it was one of the spaces that we shared. Um, we 
we both love hip hop. We both um, Londoners, uh, kind of, and we both love video games. So we would reminisce about about Zelda and Metal Gear and uh, these things, and that that was one of the things that kind of joined us together. So it seemed really natural to want to explore that space together and explore its difficulties in the way that you don't shed your identity as you enter this space, which, you know, a lot of people kind of assume you do, that you somehow through, through the virtual realm, it's like this clean slate and you're, you know, everything exterior is left behind. But of course it all kind of travels into this, this virtual space. So that's, yeah, that's, that's how it's become so integral to, to, to the work that I make is, is just cause it's part of my life. I, I spent um, a couple of years working in video game shop as, um, yeah, kind of selling retro games and import games and all that. And yeah, at that time, I wasn't even sure that I'd kind of be making art after that. But that's yeah, it kind of. Um, so so art kind of um, became layered on top of that experience as well. So that's that's kind of interesting. Amazing, yeah. And uh, and Christina, what was what was your route in? And and yeah, those sort of questions about identity within games. Is that something that you you think about with your work? I mean, I think, yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, like, like these guys, I, you know, I, I was, I was obsessed with video games as a kid. My mom used to hide her Nintendo away from me and my sister. We were, yeah, just like dreaming about Super Mario and yeah, like grew up into like, playing Mortal Kombat and Tekken when we got our, <laughs> when we got our, um, our uh, PlayStation. Um, yeah. I don't know. I've, I've gone through all the consoles, I guess, playing lots of stuff. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think I, I did, I did kind of drop it for a while because I went, um, I studied painting and animation, but then animation is just so like, um, tied in with, with games, um, and, and video games. And I guess like, um, there are a lot of overlaps, uh, in, in that sense. And then, um, and then I guess the thing that kind of drew me back to kind of thinking about games and thinking about, um, of using games as a as a medium almost was uh, the fact that it's so the, the immersivity the fact that you can actually dip into a world you can create a world um, you can and, and also the the flexible the non linear storytelling which I find so fascinating is um, is kind of the, the thing that drew me back in and I just I just love gadgets I love tinkering um, I just I just really like to um, yeah to turn things around and, and try to. Yeah, just just use them in a very DIY way, I guess. Um, I think I think as an artist, the role of the artist is to just um, turn the technology upside down and to just like use it for what it's not meant to be used for. So, so yeah, that's that's my passion, I guess. This is this is how like I'm, I'm drawn to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a common theme of of subversion, uh, I think, within all of your works. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's sort of, uh, there is, there is potentially, you know, there's a need for that within, within games, I think, because, you know, there are, there are, in theory, no limits to the kind of storytelling you can do, and yet there are limits to, you know, it feels like there is a certain expectation of what a video game looks or feels like. Um, I mean, do you find that, that, uh, when you're exhibiting this stuff, uh, do you, do you find that the exhibitors and the, and the and the galleries that you work with have they been open to your to your use of games technology? Do you think that's changing? Are people becoming kind of more fluent in in the act of exhibiting and and speaking to the public about this stuff? Um, Callum, you you kind of talked about accessibility and, and um, yeah, what what has been your experience of uh, actually exhibiting the work and 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 the response to that? Um, in a sense, I think, like, I'm not been very successful at accessing or, like, the existing arts infrastructure doesn't really understand the, the work that I'm doing, so I've been pushed to try and create my own context for my work, um, which is where this collective trust emerges from. We have a space in Berlin, um, where people who are working with, um, whether it's like video game engines, blockchain technology, theory, ecology, have come together um, 
web developers and are working together on, on creating work and sharing work with each other. And we have a Discord where people are, every week a different person presents um, things that they're working on. And we do Twitch live streams where we do experimental social formats. And so it's like, yeah, I haven't had a lot of success um, with the existing arts or world. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, maybe they'll understand it eventually, but I'm not sure about right now. <laughs> any solutions to that, David? Any, any thoughts on, uh, on working with the, with the art community? <laughs> I mean, so far, apart from... I mean, there, there are dedicated spaces like, like Further Field or maybe Fact, um, places that, that really are inside technology and, and kind of understand that world. But I'd say, you know, for the, for the majority of public spaces and um, in museums even, like most of the time as an artist, you're, you're basically telling them exactly what tech you need and almost supplying it for them yourself. Like there, there isn't the infrastructure there most of the time for you to just kind of rock up with a, with a VR file and say, yeah, here, here we go. Let's, let's, let's do this thing. It's more like, like kind of a more, um, drawn out sort of tech issue. I mean, it's, it's, it's much the same with, with video a lot of the time. I and mean, people, people have projectors more often than not nowadays, but it's still, um, there's a lot of kind of specificity that has to come into it as an artist that you, you have to kind of say that it's going to be, shown this way i think um yeah vr i'm i don't think i've come across the space maybe the serpentine that has that has vr kind of in, um embedded as as part of their their kind of offer as, as as a gallery space so it's yeah it's it's still definitely not like the mainstream um as as far as um showing art is but but then you know and really, really, that's still just painting, isn't it? <laughs> like even, scu <laughs> even sculptures have, have a difficult time getting shown. So it's like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Christina, what, what do you think about that? I mean, I think, I do think that galleries are a bit more um, in tune with, um, you know, with the fact that, yes, you know, there are digital ways of showing work. There are, I think, especially with the pandemic, um, I think not as much as um, not going in the direction of experiencing um, immersive interactive art in the gallery, but when it comes to you know having online experiences and thinking about um, digital as being digital native or digital first, um, I, I think that the, um, yeah a lot of a lot of expectations and a lot of um, yeah I, I guess like appreciation has shifted and and that's I think that's that is a one positive thing to draw as, as a digital artist, as a person working digitally, to, to draw from this whole, um, mm. of, of obviously, for the situation. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think when it comes to VR, when it comes to interactive uh, technology, um, I think, yes, like, uh, like David said, uh, there aren't that many galleries that are really prepared to support this kind of work. There are specialized galleries, but if we're talking about Yes, a museum, or if we're talking about an um, yeah, like an indie gallery, or like an, an institution that doesn't necessarily work with um, or specialize in the use of the new technologies, then it will be quite difficult. And I think it's also a matter of yes, uh, supplying your own equipment, um, making sure that you're sort of there because the, the technology is not something that people naturally know how to use. Not everyone knows how to use it, so you need to be there to guide people through the experience. So it's, it's almost like a mix between immersive theatre and, um, <laughs> and, and and having an artwork. So yeah, so there there is the extra I guess care around the work itself. You can't just plonk it somewhere and, and leave. You have to be there and support it. And I guess yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah, basic work. <laughs> yeah. In a way, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, Amy, you, you know, a few, a few times we've kind of, we've mentioned the pandemic and obviously it's, you know, we can't really ignore the impact that it's had on, on artist practice and on, on you know, the, the options for um, exhibition. Um, do you think that, you know, the result of this will be that there are um, more artists experimenting with this kind of virtual spaces? And do you think that it might prompt to kind of uh, 
a new understanding on the part of galleries as well. Do you think that, that it will have any effect on the kind of the kind of experiences that people look for? Um, the kind of experiences people want to create. Anyone got any thoughts on that? <laughs> I think I should just um, yeah jump in on on what David and Christina were saying. Um, there are definitely some specialty institutions that are very engaged with digital work and further field is incredible and has been doing this, you know, since the nineties. Um, Servantine also is very engaged with new ways of thinking about digital work. And, um, and I think the pandemic has forced other institutions to like rapidly develop digital programs and digital strategies. And um, I don't know to what extent it will have like impact beyond the next year or when it's kind of a necessity, but it seems even in these, these specialist institu institutions, there's more people or like there are more people listening to what the specialist institutions have been saying all along. Um, so thinking about how, when you're making digital work, it's really like often quite collaborative. You have different people doing different, different work on this project. Um, you're using maybe a game engine, but then also open source scripts that you found online. And you're maybe even developing a new interface for existing digital infrastructure. Um, and I think foregrounding the ways that artists are engaging with infrastructures and building new infrastructures is really key as we go into this after pandemic moment and like thinking about also the economics of art and how um how different organizational models actually like create new forms of solidarity within artistic collectives, like going beyond the idea of the individual genius artists. So I'm hopeful that there's um, changes that are happening or at least a kind of some new art ecosystems emerging um, that, that take the digital very seriously. Yeah. Um, David, how's your pandemic been? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I think, I think it feels like it's inevitable that it's going to the situation around the acceptance of digital work and digital practices is, is, has changed. And I think it feels in some way like it's changed for good, maybe, <laughs> in the sense that, that it's accepted as kind of an integral part of, of an output that actually things that you put on your website are interesting and can have a reach and um yeah our, our artworks in their own right rather than kind of just this little add-on that gets gets put put in as, as a kind of um side thing to the main event which is the kind of the large installation in the gallery or whatever um and yeah i think it comes in at a time when the arts are under attack quite literally <laughs> so um in terms of both um, art schools, um, art school funding, but also um, arts infrastructure, you know, everything's very, um, the DIY aesthetic and the DIY collective way of doing things, I think it's going to be a necessity to get things done because otherwise, because the funding is just going to kind of collapse. So um, there's these kind of two routes. And, and then also you're going to have this great flood of art students. I've been doing quite a bit of teaching over this, this period who have had to pivot to digital from whatever they're doing. And they're, they're kind of finding their feet inside this, this world. And some of them is working this, you know, some of it's not really, but it's, it's still like, like they're all having to engage with it. And I think that's going to go through, you know, on the planet has had to do with this space now for, for like a year and a half or whatever. So I think it's going to have kind of a, a long, long tail, this, this experience. Um, and yeah, I mean, as, as an artist, I've had, I've had art galleries approaching me that 
that wouldn't have otherwise, I think, <laughs> because because I'm working in the digital realm. So that's 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 interesting, you know. But um, you know, I, I would never have wanted this time to happen. <laughs> so so that's a pretty mixed feeling. Yeah, you don't want to be too, too gleeful, of course, but um, but it's but it will yeah create new ways of thinking, and I think everyone is more used to sitting at home and finding new ways to engage or finding new ways to to, um, to be part of new communities and communities, you know, there's no longer the same geographical, you know, the impetus to be geographically close or geographically representative even. Um, yeah, it's, it's cha- it changed things a lot, I think, uh, in terms of our ideas about, about how we engage. Um, Christina, do you, do you agree with that? Um, yes, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, it's. Um, I think I think it's really it's, it's really interesting. Actually, I don't know. Um, maybe five years from now, if if someone wants to archive this time, I mean, the amount, the sheer volume of things that have happened digitally is. Um, I don't know. I mean, how many kind of broken down virtual spaces will we find and, you know, all the, the virtual galleries and yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about it from like, yeah, from, from like, a, almost like a, uh, like a time capsule, um, you know, little, I don't know, little vessel that has happened within this year. And, and, you know, um, some, some really extraordinary things have happened actually because of this, um, so, for example, if you think about, um, you know, what, what Travis Scott did in Fortnite. So, you know, we had like a, a music event happening inside a, uh, you know, like inside a game that millions of people play. And, you know, Twitch is being used for fashion shows and, um, you know, like all these and, and esports have never been more relevant. And, you know, all these things kind of like blending and, and games kind of seeping through each, um, like, I mean, yeah, so many aspects of culture, I guess. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think this has been very interesting to observe during, yeah, during this difficult time. And actually, um, I, I don't think that it will, um, I don't think that we will be completely enveloped or um, expedited into a time where digital has this, you know, this, it, it, I don't think it will be more important than physical things. Because we are still human beings, we're social, um, you know, social creatures that need to touch and need to be in a place physically with others. Um, but I do think that it's um, it, it's at least kind of it has so digital has gained some sort of equality, I think, um, and can be seen as a yeah, like as as a med- medium in its own right, and it becomes, it holds the strength of. Um, kind of being there for, for social events and, and kind of for, for bringing people together in collective experiences online. And it's centering the player and their creativity as much as the, the creativity of, of, of making the space and making the game, right? I mean, I'm kind of interested to know that as, as people who have, who have tinkered around with games, do you feel like there is, um, uh, between yourselves as artists and game developers, do you think that there is a sort of uh, what's that relationship? Is there? Do you think there would be some of them would be hostile to what you what you do with their worlds, or, or you know, is is it is it two separate worlds? And how can we bring them together? What what sort of uh, what sort of connections do we make across that divide? That's sort of David. Yeah, I'm. I'm I know, as someone who kind of dreamed of being a game developer for for a little while, I <laughs> I, I think that the the possibility is there. I, it's 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 kind of surprising that that you know that there hasn't been more direct interaction between between developers and, and artists actually. Um, you know, on a kind of big lane scale, it, it could. I'm, I'm just thinking of like that. I think John Rathman pictures inside the film Robocop kind of moment. I mean, you know, not, not a big fan of either, but it's, it's just, you know, that kind of 
bringing together of things has hasn't really happened with games. Like you haven't seen like Damien Hurst enter into Minecraft or something. You know, like like this that's that's quite possible, and it, you know they're, they're kind of quite popular things. So it, it feels like they're they're very kind of far apart in some way, but. You know, you, you look at the people who are actually making the stuff, and they're quite similar kind of people, like quite kind of similar concerns. There's a huge indie gaming scene, which is basically indie game, you know, gamers making a sort of art, and then there's artists making a sort of game, and then you sort of have this, you know, where's the kind of mushy, mushy middle place? I'm just thinking <laughs> artists like Daniel Braithwaite Shirley or um, Uma Breakdown. I mean, and then where's the is Kitty Horror Show is, uh, are they, which side are they on? You know, it kind of, it becomes very difficult to say, say what, what is, is sort of fitting into the game space and what isn't. But then, you know, the games world, just like the art world, there's so many different spaces. It's like, you know, the AAA space is like a completely different world from, from people making stuff to put on itch.io. So I, I, you know, and I don't know, me making art is a completely different thing from Ashley Gormley making art. It's like, they're, they're sort of, it's how to, how to make those connections. I think, yeah, it almost requires someone to, to, to bring those words together in, 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 a, in, a, in a frank way. I love the idea of the machine that just has. <laughs> Callum, what do you think? Do you think that there are uh, there are particular sort of games that cross the divide that you can think of, or uh, um, how, how do you think we can sort of knit these two communities together? I think just uh, on the how can we facilitate these collaborations, like it also comes down to funding. Um, I think artists often access funds that are for specific things for work that's shown in specific contexts and like even with with video work it's sometimes hard to fit to a arts grant context and then to access these like bigger media or like video game grants has like a lot more um i know they ask for a lot more formal um like things from artists who aren't used to maybe like formalizing the way they're working, the collaborations that they have in their practices and maybe don't have CVs that are legible to the, the media funding bodies. Um, so I think it would be really important for, for funds to start to encourage artists to access funding um, and to understand that the experimentation that they do can be really impactful for the medium as a whole. Um, and in terms of games that do cross the divide, I mean, immediately everything by David O'Reilly comes to mind. Um, uh, the Stanley parable. And then, yeah, I mean, I like Ian Chang's work emissaries also like self playing video games. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm kind of more interested in work that engages with people and is understandable to people on different levels than works that is so introspective and rhetorical and trapped within discursive loops that it is only understandable by people who have master's degrees from Central St. Martin's or something. Like, <laughs> I think video games are, it's like, it pre presents an ideal for art. It's like, um, yeah, it's very exciting to try and engage with that industry. Yeah, I was just, sorry. Sorry, I, guess, I was just thinking that you know there is very much this encouragement of artists to move into the filmmaking space, say through Film London, etc. But it doesn't feel like that same move has happened with games to this uh, at this moment. So. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to make it happen. We need to make it happen. So uh, we're, we're going to wrap up shortly. Um, but I just wanted to give everyone an opportunity to uh, just talk about the future a little bit and tell me uh, yeah, what you're working on at the moment and where you see uh, this, this work with interactive society. Christina, what are you what are you looking forward to in the future? 
Right. So um, I have been very, um, yeah, I've, I've been very, very lucky to receive some um, extra funding from Prince Klaus Fund. Um, it's it's a um, from from the Netherlands um, to basically use on my um, artistic development, and I'm currently working on kind of building um, um, a web VR experience um, that doesn't need to be accessed through a headset. So I'm, I'm kind of experimenting with different kind of interactive experiences and non-linear, um, like non- non-linear script writing um, for, for online stuff. So, you know, like, um, like Callum was saying, you know, I think currently for me, the most important thing is um, kind of making things accessible for, for the wider public. So that also means that uh, that yes, it's it's written and in, in a in an accessible language. It's done in an accessible way that kind of makes for an easy navigation through a work. And I'm just kind of trying to create something. And and I I do agree that games are really good at this kind of telling a story that really brings the like the, the audience in. And and also letting go of that control that you need to kind of control the entire environment. Um, you know, this is this is what I really like about games is that you know open world games. You know, you're you're kind of left there and you can you can walk around and look around things. It doesn't have to have um, like a certain ending. And this is what I'm kind of currently looking at. And um, on another project, I'm which I'm currently. Um, um, kind of developing is I'm working with a choreographer, Georgia Tego, who's an amazing choreographer and a good friend. Um, and I'm using a new tool that is currently developed by researchers across UAL and Goldsmith called InteractML. Um, and it's, uh, it's a machine learning tool that enables um, kind of like movement based interactions in VR. So I'm using this for Unity, and um, yes, together with Georgia, we're creating a like collaborative piece that kind of involves choreography. So the user is also a dancer in VR. So it's another piece that I'm quite excited about. Um, and I think once we're out of the pandemic, would be something very interesting to um, yeah to look forward to. Amazing to see that. Uh, same question for you, David. What are you what are you working on at the moment? What's the future hold for you? Yeah, I've been um, continuing work on my um, role-playing game, The World After, which is uh, a role-playing game that deals with uh, climate change and uh, trying to build new communities um, as humanity or post-humanity emerges from kind of post-apocalyptic space. Um, And I'm... Yeah, currently um, it's a completely collaborative project and I work with lots of groups around the country to for them to create effectively like self-portrait spaces so they think about their community and what they would like their community to be and then, um, yeah, extrapolate that into sort of particular role-playing game tropes. So this is a kind of a, a world that I'm building. It's becoming a project called Lost Eons um, and that's going to turn into kind of go the full circle and become a um a virtual space so working with um i'm still undecided as to whether it's going to be kind of shonky 3d graphics or or kind of uh, 16 bit stuff but um somewhere in that sort of space in a space that you can explore explore the world and have these kind of emergent narratives come out there um you kind of work together to bring down the evil uh, corporate entity that is Cryorg. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. And uh, Callum, what about you? What's the future help? Currently, a lot of my work is going into um, more the like collaborative models for making cooperative artworks that engage with immersion or interactivity. Um, so I'm working on a project called Black Swan, which is a, a set of digital tools that enable groups of creative practitioners to own their own data and decide how resources are distributed within groups. So it's kind of maybe sounds different, but it it's trying to understand how the digital work I was making and the, the experiments that I've done as part of this collective need to also think about how value is redistributed and and ensure that everybody who's worked on a project has stake in it. And and through that, trying to rethink actually the economics of the art world and and 
hopefully propose some more um, sustainable models. That's fantastic. Well, that all sounds really, really exciting. Thank you so much to everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, thanks to the London Games Festival for bringing the group together. Uh, and you can find out more about the festival, which is running until 20th of March. Just visit www.games.london. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks. Thank you.